All right, hi you guys, welcome back to NCHV's conference day three. Um, so today's session is gonna be on um, serving tribal and rural veterans. Hope you're in the right place. Um, so we will have three great presentations for you guys today. Before we jump in, I have a couple of technical comments. Um, you guys are all on mute, but you can still talk to us and the speakers by using your questions box in the drop down menu on the right hand side of your screen. Um, so if you have comments or feedbacks, if you want to introduce yourself, um, ask questions or stuff throughout the session, please use that box to do so. Um, we're we're going to save about 15 minutes at the very end for Q&A, so we will leave some time open for discussion. I um, just want to remind everybody the sessions are being recorded and we do share a daily email every day after um, conference to kind of give you a recap of the day before and to share the recordings and slides from the from the previous day's sessions so if there are links or resources and stuff that you want you will be getting the slides so no worries there um and then one last thing when we get done with the session today you will see a poll pop up at the very end um if you will you know give us your feedback that way that way we can make some changes if necessary for next year's conference um other than that i think we're going to go ahead and turn it over to presenters for today um, and I'll be back at the very end for Q and A. Well, great. Well, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tony Walters. I'm the executive director of the National American Indian Housing Council. And uh, after me, we'll we'll hear from Joshua Stewart uh, and Chris Johnson. I'll let them introduce themselves. Uh, we'll, we'll do that real quick. How about Joshua? You want to introduce yourself first? Sure. Thanks, Tony. Um, Hey everybody, Joshua Stewart. I'm with FAHI. We're an organization uh, working to build the American dream in Appalachia. Um, and although I can't see anybody that's listening, I imagine I know quite a few of you. So um, great to see folks and uh, looking forward to questions. And I'm Chris Johnson and I am the get the honor to be the president and CEO of Nation's Finest. We'll be celebrating our 50th birthday next year of providing support to uh, to veterans in rural communities. Thanks for having me. Okay. Well, I certainly appreciate involving tribal communities in these types of discussions and, and coming to a conference uh, like this, and, I, and I'm sure it's the same for rural areas. You know, I think we all have the kind of similar challenges, right? We're serving pretty small populations out of the overall uh, uh, country's population with, with, with homelessness issues or with veterans issues. Uh, and here we're compounding it another layer, uh, kind of going into you know harder, just harder to reach or harder to serve tribal or rural communities. So certainly look forward to discussion and any questions you guys have uh, for any of us today. Uh, there's a lot of overlap with our types of organizations, the type of advocacy that we do on the, the state, regional, federal levels. So hopefully you, you guys learn quite a bit from, from all of us today. Uh, but as I said, I'm the executive director of the National American Indian Housing Council. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Just a little bit about uh, the, the Housing Council itself. Uh, we've been around for almost 40 years. Uh, we're based in Washington, D.C. Uh, we were formed by the tribal housing programs across the country. Uh, so there's 574 federally recognized tribes. There's a handful of state recognized tribes across the country as well uh, that receive federal funding uh, for housing programs. And those are our membership. That's who we were created by. That's who uh, we serve. Uh, that's who kind of governs our organization. Uh, we host annual members meetings each year uh, where we hear about the, the needs, the priorities of our tribal housing programs across the country uh, and then conduct our you know, organization services uh, in response to that. Uh, we represent about 85 to 90 percent of the tribes, um, either individually or through our umbrella housing organizations. Some tribes are, are very small, so they might link up with neighboring tribes. Uh, this is particularly true in Alaska. Uh, and then they'll form kind of an umbrella housing organization that serves multiple areas. So uh, we, we would top off at about 350 members, uh, despite there being 574 tribes, uh, because the umbrella organization is probably a maximum of 350 members for NAIHC. And we've got about 85 to 90 percent of those who sign up uh, every year and participate every year in our organization's functions. Uh, we have a website there that you can reach us at and uh, explore a little bit more about tribal housing programs. You can go to the next slide. Uh, so just giving you a little bit of a snapshot on kind of, you know, the, the what we're working with here with tribal communities, uh, veterans, Native American veterans. Like I said, there's 574 uh, federally recognized tribes. Uh, there's They only cover about 34 states. So about 34 of the 50 states will have tribal reservation or tribal communities within them. 
Uh, so when we're talking about advocacy for tribal issues, it's usually at the federal level. Uh, you know, as many of you know, there's uh, a, a kind of a greater relationship between the federal government and the Native American tribes across the country based on the history over the past two or 300 years, treaty making with tribes. Uh, and now, uh, you know, there's a, there's a well-established kind of trust responsibility between the United States government uh, and tribal communities as well. So when we're working on advocacy, it actually is a bit tougher for us because, because we're only represented uh, or only kind of part of 34 states, it makes it very difficult to do some uh, advocacy work because we're, we're already at 16 states, many more you know, house districts who don't have tribal constituencies or tribal communities within them. So most of those elected officials may not be aware uh, or, or know the importance uh, of serving tribal communities or the relationship between the United States and tribal communities. So we, we're already kind of starting at a, an advocacy deficit where we've got to do a lot of education and outreach uh, to a lot of states and elected officials uh, who may not uh, be aware of some of the, the needs and, and issues facing tribal communities. And that's across the board, not just for housing and not just for veterans issues, but uh, it makes uh, tribal advocacy efforts you know, more difficult from the, out, from the onset. With respect to Native American veterans, you know, these are just some numbers I found on the Department of Defense website, some other Native organizations who specialize more on veterans issues specifically. Uh, 150,000 Native American veterans across the country. Uh, it's been a pretty kind of well-established fact, and I'm sure the changing demographics over the last 10 to 20 years may have changed this, but uh, for a very long time, tribal communities per capita uh, have, have actually served in the United States military at some of the highest rates among all demographics. Uh, and some people might find that a little bit surprising just based on the history with uh, tribes in the United States. Uh, but uh, you know, it's certainly something uh, Native American communities are very proud of, certainly hold our veterans in, in high esteem uh, across the country, uh, and, and, and rightfully so. Uh, you know, we've, Native Americans have served in you know, pr pretty much every war uh, that the United States has been a part of over the last two or 300 years, and that's, uh, and that's even without necessarily being citizens of, of the United States. Uh, American Indians didn't actually uh, obtain kind of legal citizenship until 1924. Uh, so we're not even at 100 years yet for a lot of our uh, American Indian citizenship uh, status. Uh, but we were serving uh, in, in many wars. I'm sure you've, you've heard stories of uh, code talkers uh, being very important uh, for the efforts in World War I, World War II. Uh, so just, a, just kind of a, a snapshot of you know, how involved tribes have been uh, in the nation's military, the service that they've provided over the, the decades and centuries. Um, and then kind of you know, where they are today. You know, once they kind of leave the military service, a lot of veterans you know, try to return to their, uh, uh, their home communities. And a lot of them are rural in nature as well, gonna have a lack of infrastructure development uh, and other, other amenities that, you know, uh, services that might be provided to veterans are gonna be harder to come by in some of our uh, rural and tribal areas. I think you can jump to the next slide again. One of the primary housing uh, projects uh, that tribes are a part of, uh, particularly with uh, housing and, and homelessness, uh, uh, combating homelessness in tribal communities is the Tribal HUD VASH program. If you're, many of you are familiar with the larger program, probably many of you are familiar with the tribal version or set aside of that program. Uh, but HUD VASH was created in 2008 uh, uh, by Congress. It just wasn't reaching tribal communities for kind of the first five to 10 years of that uh, program. Uh, so, uh, tribes got together, they, they lobbied Congress, this was before I became involved with uh, the Housing Council, uh, but the, they secured a tribal set-aside uh, through, tri uh, through congressional appropriations beginning in 2015 uh, with about, a, I think it was a $5 million or $7 million initial set-aside for the Tribal HUD Bash pilot uh, program. And it was really meant to, you know, reach these veterans in these tribal communities that may not have been served by the larger HUD Bash program at the time. Uh, we, and HUD took that funding, they, they awarded funding to 26 pilot tribes, uh, and there's been some good success with this program over the last six years, five to six years, uh, but there's a lot of obstacles as well, and these aren't probably unique to tribal communities, these are going to be kind of across the board with rural areas as well. Some of the bigger issues that we've seen, uh, just housing stock issues, I'm sure a lot of you have heard, you know, issues about the housing shortage across the country. Uh, and that's that's true everywhere, urban areas, suburban areas, uh, rural areas in particular. Uh, and for tribal communities, it's usually harder to develop new housing stock just based on the lack of infrastructure. You know, it costs more for construction, getting uh, materials out to these communities, a, a lack of roads, sewer, and, and uh, other 
uh, you know, electricity lines going out to some of these areas uh, just make it harder to develop or cost more to develop. Uh, so there's been a, a continuing issue, not just for HUD bash and tribal veteran homelessness issues, but across the board for tribal housing, it's been an issue. Uh, but then also, you know, getting access to the VA supportive services, that's, uh, that's a key component of the HUD bash program. Uh, you know, a lot of the VA centers just aren't located near tribal communities, they're usually located near urban hubs, and then, you know, veterans can uh, try, it's all about economies of scale, right? So you're trying to get uh, service to as many veterans as you can through the VA services, and it just doesn't always reach some of our rural and tribal communities. So, you know, having a lack of those counselors available uh, really hindered some of the, the tribal HUD bash efforts in the early years. Uh, VA has come a long way with hiring. Uh, they've they've uh, started to have relationships or partnerships with the Indian Health Service, which is another federal healthcare system that does focus on tribal communities. And then also the tribes themselves are, are starting to get uh, contracts with the VA to help have uh, tribal staff, tribal healthcare staff, uh, and, and support staff uh, provide these supportive services to our veterans uh, in the tribal community itself uh, through through contracts. So uh, a lot of work has been done over these first four or five years uh, of the tribal HUD bash program. And I don't think these are unique issues to tribes, but it certainly exacerbates uh, in tribal communities just based on a lot of their locations. And, and really it's, it's all about getting the best quality services to uh, tribal members, veterans uh, in their communities, right? I think uh, some tribes uh, who are operating the tribal HUD bash program still sending some of their veterans you know, to some, you know, off reservation or off tribal community where there's more housing uh, op opportunities or options and closer to, to VA services. So there's still that issue there or tension where, you know, we have community members, tribal members who want to be with their, near their families, near their communities, uh, but to receive some of the services they need, uh, they may have to go, you know, 50 miles, 100 miles to a, a near, uh, a bigger town or urban area uh, to receive some of those services. So just trying to bridge those gaps as best uh, we can uh, for their for their sake and, and for their benefit and let them you know have the housing options opportunities where they would like to be. Uh, the HUD bash program is a little bit more flexible for tribal veterans. It doesn't necessarily require kind of an acute homeless uh, uh, issue. Uh, there's at risk of homelessness uh, for for our vet tribal veterans, and it does encapsulate uh, their veterans' families as well. So uh, it's a little bit more flexible for tribes in that regard. But I think that you know, is, 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 is helpful and needed uh, when there's the other obstacles that tribal communities are facing. So uh, certainly it's something that we are appreciative of, you know, HUD, the VA, our members of Congress, uh, groups like the National Coalition who have you know, advocated for improvements to HUD bash over these years, uh, really starting to see some of the, the benefits uh, finally flow to tribal communities and tribal veterans as well. So it's been a, a, a lot of help in these past few years. Uh, we can go to the next slide. And the other, the other kind of primary uh, housing program uh, for tribal veterans is the, the VA Native American Direct Loan Program. Uh, these are direct mortgage loans by the VA to Native Americans uh, living in, in tribal areas, or, or, or actually, I don't think it's really limited to tribal areas, but uh, the program does require uh, MOUs with the tribes uh, of the veteran uh, that uh, is participating in the program. So it's, it's largely limited to tribal uh, reservations or community footprints. Uh, but it's uh, again, there's an outreach issue. As I mentioned, there's 570 tribes across the country, spread out across the country. Uh, and the program only has seven full-time employees uh, at the VA uh, direct loan program. Uh, so it's really you know, a struggle to make sure Native American veterans are aware of the opportunity, aware of that uh, uh, loan program that could help them out. Uh, it relies on marketing uh, just through you know, VA's normal uh, channels regional uh, VA contacts, tribal housing program staff as well. Um, and right now only about 100 of the tribes have signed MOUs with the VA uh, regarding this program. And, and certainly an ongoing effort for NAIC and for tribes is, and for the VA is to get more tribes either aware uh, of that program and the service it provides and, and make sure that's an opportunity that the veterans in those communities can access. Uh, you know, I think you're hearing a lot of different resources and programs across this whole uh, conference this week. I think it, it all comes down to being a bandwidth issue, right? You, it's not necessarily capacity so much as there's so, uh, so much work to get done, so many different resources to access. You're trying to find the, the best fits, the ones that can go the furthest uh, and help the most people in your communities. And you know, sometimes it's direct loan program, you know, very a great program 
uh, but for any one community, having you know veterans who are are home buyer ready, uh, it just uh, it doesn't rise to a, at the attention level of our, some of our housing programs to to really focus on when there's you know lots of other unmet needs and other types of resources out there. There, I know there are some years where this direct loan program has really only provided you know a few dozen. Uh, home home mortgage loans uh, in a single year. So certainly a lot of improvement that can be made uh, with the direct loan program. And that's something that NEHC is working towards as well. I think we can go ahead and jump to the next slide. So just quickly, what, what are we doing is kind of just building on the things I've talked about. You know, ex expansion of HUDVASH is really only operating in 26 tribal communities at the moment. Uh, but you know, there's veterans going to be across all of, the, all of our uh, tribes across the country. So wanting to get access to that program uh, for all tribes, there is there have been bills in Congress that would make that program permanent and open it up to uh, more tribes across the country. Uh, the tribal HUD bash bill has actually passed the Senate the past two Congresses, um, and, we, and we've got it kind of stuck on the House side for the last two Congresses, which is pretty rare, I would say, uh, in terms of advocacy and getting bills uh, enacted. Uh, but that's where we are, and we're trying to you know figure out how we can get that bill through the House uh, this Congress and, and get that done. Uh, there are administrative efforts at HUD to really expand the program with internal internally, uh, so trying to mitigate the efforts of while we're working for the legislation that would make the program uh, fully available for every tribe, at least having some middle ground there and, and some progress there. Improving that direct loan program, the access and outreach, of course, is another uh, priority for NEHC. One of the advocacy efforts that we undertook last year was getting tribes more involved in the HUD Continuum of Care program. Uh, I know many of you are familiar with that. A lot of it involves cooperating agencies at the local state levels. Uh, tribes could participate in that before, but they were never kind of a primary grantee. Um, and as you know, many tribes are somewhat isolated or rural in nature, so they didn't always have those local partners available. Uh, but without them, they couldn't apply for these continuum care grants. We've, we've uh, got some champions on the Hill who uh, were able to get this kind of small fixed pass and make tribes eligible for that program moving forward in future years. So uh, we're excited for tribes for that opportunity. Uh, and we'll continue to uh, you know, find other uh, avenues that will help tribes uh, attack their homelessness issues in their tribal communities. Do a lot of training in TA to tribal housing programs on all issues, hollow housing issues, and certainly we do that for veteran uh, or for ho uh, homelessness issues as well. We actually do have some training in TA dollars specific to the BASH program as well. So we do provide training in TA uh, specifically for the veteran supportive housing program. As many of you know, the, the homelessness issues in tribal communities look probably a little bit different. There's not a lot of you know, folks you know, out uh, you know, on streets. Uh, you know, it's usually a small knit community. You're gonna have a lot of issues of overcrowded homes and bringing someone in to, to lay on a couch or sleep on a couch. So uh, certainly always some issues there, struggling with how to best combat those issues uh, when it's not as clear you know, what the full kind of homelessness uh, issues are within a community because it's, it's sometimes hidden uh, through that way. I think you can jump to the next slide. Uh, I think this is kind of the last slide I have. It's just what more can be done. Uh, so I certainly encourage all of you kind of attending this conference just to reach out and engage with tribes. Uh, you know, we're here as a, a national organization. There's 500 local or, or tribes across the country, tons of regional tribal uh, organizations as well. Each of our our housing programs are separated into nine geographic regions, and each of them have a regional housing association. So there's points of contact with each of those levels. Uh, I would encourage you all to uh, to reach out if you have resources, if you have, if you want to engage uh, tribal communities and tribal members through your existing programs. Uh, there's good opportunities to do that. And, and mostly I'd recognize that tribal members are probably eligible for most programs, right? I think a lot of people think of Native Americans, uh, you know, only eligible for programs through the tribe or through, you know, certain federal offices. But these are still state citizens. They're still American citizens. They're still, you know, veterans of our uh, armed services. So uh, I'm sure they're eligible for most programs that are happening uh, wherever they're happening across the country. So, you know, certainly, you know, include them in outreach. Uh, let them know. Don't. You know, if they if you don't think they fit eligibility wise, you know, try to reach out and find uh, where the best uh, points of contact for them are moving forward. But certainly encourage you all to just to keep an eye out and, and take a look to see, you know, if there are natives in your footprint of, uh, of activities, uh, be sure that you're including uh, them as best you can uh, and, and, and know that uh, you know, they may not be getting served by their tribe. A lot of tribal veterans may be you know, living in an urban area away from their tribe uh, and may not know where to turn. So certainly. Uh, you know, encourage all of you here at this conference and and, and, and everywhere to uh, you know, be wary of uh, tribal veterans maybe uh, kind of being 
in a blind spot and certainly want to help connect those dots as best we can. So uh, always look to us at NHT. We're happy to help, happy to connect those dots and be a resource for you all. And, and, uh, and, and look forward to future conversations with many of you uh, attending today. Here's just a picture at most of our tribal events. We almost always have a color guard uh, bringing in flags, posting flags for our conferences and events. This is a, a color guard from Seneca Nation uh, in New York, where we did a conference about two uh, years ago uh, before COVID came in and kind of took away our in-person meetings. But uh, uh, certainly proud of veterans across the country certainly proud of our Native veterans and their service as well, and uh, look forward to hearing from the next speakers and, and any questions you guys have today and future conversations. And with that, I'll, I think I'll turn it over to Josh Stewart. Boy, that, that shouldn't have been that hard for me to unmute. Thanks, Tony. Um, you'd think a digital Native would be able to do this pretty easily. Um, just before you hop off, Tony, I just wanted to say, if you had changed or whatever, sorry, man, um, if you had changed the word tribal to Appalachia, you basically could have done my presentation. And right. I have so many right. notes. Of, so if if I look scattered during this, it's because I'm trying to find that thing I, I wrote down where Tony said this about the, about tribal lands, and, and it's basically the same thing. So thank you. Um, enjoy, enjoy being off camera. Um, so Hello again to everybody out there. Um, Joshua Stewart with FAHI. I'm the Senior Advocacy Manager here. Um, and I'm responsible for my organization's policy analysis and federal and congressional relations. Basically, the job is to make sure that our members are heard in, in DC. Um, uh, as I said at the top, you know, uh, I probably know some of you out there, so hello. Um, for those of you that don't know, I, I worked at NCHV for a few years. Um, and uh, I, I never thought, you know, every year for five years or whatever it was, uh, going down to the Grand Hyatt, all that work, all the late nights, um, that I would say what I'm about to say, which is that I miss the Grand Hyatt, and I wish we were all there together. Um, and uh, just sort of, you know, to everybody out there, hello. Um, really enjoyed working with you, and I hope everybody's doing well. Um, so. With that, let's let's roll on. Um, if you'll advance the slide, please, David. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about Fahi and a little bit about Appalachia, where we work. So we were founded in 1980 um, with just a few members, I believe it was six members from Kentucky and Virginia who were working in housing, uh, who came together um, uh, to raise their voices up. And, and they, they were at a USDA conference and they realized they sort of had unique issues to the rest of the country and, and wanted to advocate together. Uh, if you fast forward uh, 41 years now, um, we are now a network of more than 50 local leaders working to build the American dream in Appalachia and ensure prosperity for everyone. Um, we really believe that this is a prosperous nation and then and that everyone can and everyone should be able to live in a place where um, you know you can afford to find a, a safe decent place to live you can find a good job you can have a family and raise your children and send them to good schools uh, you know you can have access to the internet which is a, a big topic nowadays and that you can retire in dignity and and the sad fact of the matter is that that's not true everywhere in this country um, and it's not true in many places in Appalachia um, and that means that we have to sort of take a whole community approach um, and we work in the five areas of your screen there at the bottom economic opportunity education health and well-being housing and leadership um, to get to that because we're not just working with individual people and families though we are but we're also working on the community level and if you'll excuse me I have to refer to some notes because it's been a very busy morning um, I'll talk about uh, how we hit those five places a couple of different ways. The first of which is um, through FAHI um, as a sort of organization where we're a CDFI, which is also uh, it's referred to as a CDFI, but it's Community Development Financial Institution. Um, and you can think of us, if you're not familiar with that type of organization, as sort of a nonprofit bank. We don't take contributions or deposits from individuals, but we do go locate uh, capital from federal, state, and local governments or private enterprise or uh, philanthropy and use that capital to make uh, investments into the region through nonprofits that are 
building daycare centers or uh, rehab centers or YMCAs or firehouses, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, we also, of course, affordable housing. How could I forget? Um, and uh, we also make uh, mortgages to low-income people, first-time home buyers, um, people with that are deemed credit risk by banks that, that banks would never touch. Um, uh, because as you know, it's expensive being poor and it can sometimes wreck your credit being poor. Um, but we, we provide that sort of um, through our members and through our CDFI, provide that sort of entry into stable long-term homeownership um, to prevent to prevent homelessness, to increase economic earning potential of individuals, families, and communities, the whole gamut. Um, and the whole reason behind this investment strategy is that we're sort of fighting decades, if not centuries, of disinvestment in Appalachia. Um, and, and I'll probably talk a little bit more about disinvestment as we go on. Um, but why don't we go to the next slide, um, which I'm going to speed through very quickly because my practice run uh, saw this to be a very long presentation. So I'll just say that the second thing that we do um, and the reason we were founded is advocacy. We work at the state level, we work at the federal level, um, we work on public opinion, we, we do civic engagement and leadership development, but suffice to say that we truly believe in strength in numbers, which is our tagline, um, and that the core of our mission is advocacy, and you'll hear more about that as I, as I just go through the presentation today. So next slide, please, sir. Thank you. The most important work that we do, though, is through our members and the on-the-ground work um, of improving our communities. And, and here's a map of, of those communities and of our service areas. Um, and I should say we work in six states, uh, from here in Maryland, shout out to the Marylanders, um, down through West Virginia and Virginia and Kentucky and Tennessee and Alabama. Um, we have a wide variety of members, both in size and mission. Uh, we've got some large uh, community action agencies that might have hundreds of staff. We've got PHAs, and we've got small, like, mom-and-pop organizations, which I'm not sure that they would like me to say, to call them mom-and-pops, but I think it's a nice, fuzzy term for it. Basically, it's, you know, small organizations in small places. They might have two permanent staff, but they could have hundreds of volunteers come in a year to help with home rehab or uh, home construction, that sort of thing. And since we were founded as a housing organization, all of the nonprofits that are members um, of our network are in some way involved in housing. And that could be uh, housing development, um, rental or home ownership, could be home repair. Um, but they all also do a, a variety of other things and they run the gamut from homeless programs to ch uh, early childhood education, <clears throat> excuse me, early childhood education, daycares, youth build, that sort of stuff. Uh, to recovery. Um, obviously, we have an opioid addiction problem uh, in the entire country, but Appalachia is particularly hard hit. Um, we have folks that run transport systems for their counties and, uh, of course, downtown redevelopment and all the sort of traditional community and economic development work. Um, and then some real infrastructure side of things uh, with sewage and wastewater and drinking water and broadband. Next slide, please, David. Um, I would not be a policy nerd if I didn't start a conversation about rural um, by telling you what I mean by it, and also by telling you about um, the fun fact that the United States government itself has 15 different definitions of what rural is. Um, three maps at the bottom there just illustrate um, what is and what isn't. What I use as a shorthand to refer to rural is anything outside of a HUD MSA, so anything outside of a metropolitan statistical area. Um, that's a terrible definition, and if anybody, if any of my friends from HACK are here, especially Lance, I, I'm very sorry that I'm using that, but um, it's, it's a quick and dirty shorthand. It does include places um, that are not rural in character or by population size, right, like towns, large towns, uh, or suburbs of urban areas that aren't classed in the in the MSA for one reason or another. And it doesn't include in rural um, some places that are very obviously rural in character because they fall under a catch-all of an MSA. Um, but that is actually an important point. There's um, a not exactly perfect fit there of, of the HUD MSA, HUD non-metropolitan median, I'm sorry, non-metropolitan counties. Um, 
as the difference between urban and rural. It's not exactly perfect. And we're going to come back to that later because um, I will be talking about how HUD definitions can actually get in the way of, um, of making investments and, and in serving rural communities and populations. So next slide, please, David. For now, I want to talk about also how vastly different um, rural areas can be sort of lumped together when we just say rural. It's sort of papers over the differences. Um, we use it as a catchphrase, but it, 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 it does cover a lot of things. I mentioned population size and the character, but um, there's something even more basic, which is geography, which makes different rural places much different from one another in the issues and barriers that they face and their strengths. Um, so you've got two images in front of you, um, and they are distances and travel times from very similar sized communities, uh, on the left in front of you is one in Kentucky and the one on the right is from Wyoming um, and their travel times and distances to their nearest VA medical center. Here's the first one. Tony talked about this, right? Um, in Kentucky, the nearest one uh, to Hazard, Kentucky is, is down in Mountain Home, Tennessee. Um, but uh, you see there that it says 76 miles. Well, that's a computer generated as the crow flies number. Um, and uh, that's not how the roads get there. Wyoming, similar issue, right? It's 211 miles from the nearest VAMC from um, uh, Jeffrey City. Um, but what's important is not how the crow flies, but how people get there. So even though um, in Wyoming, this in this example, there are 115, I wrote it down somewhere, I did the math, 125 miles further from a VAMC, the travel times are not that different. Um, and that's the, the mountainous terrain and the way that the roads were developed in Kentucky it means you have to take a very circuitous route. Um, and um, the travel times for an individual um, are much longer. And so uh, obviously this is uh, germane to the population because we're talking about VA medical centers, but this is true for pretty much anything. Um, it, can, it can be isolating. Um, and so I, uh, I point this out for three reasons. The first is to note that point about the geography and the isolation. Um, the second is to show the differences between the two places that are classed as rural um, by basically every single metric. They're, they're basically the most metrics call these two places exactly, you know, the same size, the same character, that sort of thing, um, but very different geographies. Um, but finally, I also want to point out that, that despite my best efforts here, I can only really talk about what rural is like in Appalachia. Um, your mileage may vary. If you're in rural Wyoming or rural Hawaii or rural Nevada, um, so your mileage may vary, and um, I'll be uh, I'll be keeping that in mind. Um, I'll also be talking about worst case scenarios here. So to make a policy point, um, I know there's a lot of great work going on in rural areas. We just heard about some from Tony. I know we're going to hear about it from Chris in a minute. Um, so please don't feel you know not seen if if I don't. Um, if I don't point that out, um, because I'm trying to make a couple points here. Next slide, please, David, and this is one of those tricky ones. Um, I should also point out that Appalachia is not just uh, entirely rural. Um, you can go ahead and just advance through those, David. Um, we also work in several urban locations, um, some of which are quite large. Um, uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, and Birmingham um, are uh, large places. In fact, Birmingham is the 49th largest MSA in, the, in America with 1.1 um, million people. Um, so it's not just, uh, not just rural areas, which is a point I like to make about Appalachia. So go ahead and advance through those, David, and to the next full slide. Thank you. Um, so many of you will hear about Appalachia and have a mental image that, um, you know, uh, it's synonymous with poverty, which unfortunately is often the case. Um, we are one of the most highly disadvantaged regions in the nation um, and have one of the highest concentrations of persistent poverty in the country. So persistent poverty is a measure of a location's population over time, and it um, is defined as a place uh, where more than 20% of the population has lived in poverty for more than 30 years. So on both of these maps, the red uh, and on the left, also the, the dark orange, um, are persistent poverty counties. The left is from USDA and the right is, is one I butchered together myself. Um, 
<laughs> unfortunately. Uh, it's not very pretty, but it does prove a point. So on the map on the right, you've got those blue areas. Those are MSAs, which is my shorthand for urban places. And you'll see um, that the gray areas are rural areas, and you'll see that dozens of those persistent poverty counties around eastern Kentucky and, and West Virginia, even though there's dozens, only three of them are in MSAs. Um, and that's not an accident, right? There's a confluence of factors here, but basically um, we're talking about disinvestment in Appalachia and in rural places where extractive industries have been the norm for hundreds of years, um, as well as sort of the economic effects of, of sort of urban versus rural places. Um, wages, wage growth, unemployment, uh, economic elasticity are all sort of worse in rural places according to almost every study and have been for decades. Um, in fact, there was an Appalachian Regional Commission study that came out literally two months before the pandemic uh, that said that most of Appalachia had still not recovered from the 2008 recession. So that's sort of the story, right? That like Appalachia bounces from one crisis to the next. I kind of briefly mentioned opioid uh, epidemic. These, these things are all sort of related um, and run into one another. So there's two takeaways here. The first is that um, our rural places are very often um, um, we're not working solely to help individuals and families, but we're sort of working uh, across the board on communities um, because we're not sort of, especially in these persistent poverty counties, not faced with the wild inequalities of an urban place like where I'm from in D.C., uh, where you've got very rich people and very poor people living on the street. Um, what we have, in fact, is a very large concentration, the majority of the population of, of sort of low income um, or living in poverty. And so we've got broad-based poverty and, and economic stagnation that we're contending with. Um, and the second, and that takes me to my next slide here, um, is that our homelessness response system is um, more targeted towards upstream and prevention efforts. Um, and some of that is a function of population, some of it's a function of capacity and infrastructure. Um, but again, here we see a difference between two broadly similar rural places. So you've got Kentucky on your right, and neighboring to Tennessee on your left. And this is a map of the COC uh, system in those states. Um, you'll see Tennessee has a much more developed COC system than, than does Kentucky, even in the rural places um, between Knoxville and the Tri-Cities further to the east. In Kentucky, you'll see that there are three COCs and the balance of state covers literally the entire state. So that includes all the persistent poverty counties of Eastern Kentucky that are mountainous, the middle of the state, um, which is the bluegrass, which is different economics, uh, different geographies, different populations, different problems, different capacity. And then out west towards Illinois and Paducah, you've got all the same issue again. Um, so that's a that's a that's an issue, right? That's how we make plans. That's how we deliver resources. Um, that's how we work together. And and it's different place to place. So slide, please, David. And this is the second uh, crazy slide with a couple of advances there, should be three. Um, but that's all system level stuff um, that only sort of people like me care about uh, and probably several of you on the call there. Um, but when it comes to what matters to people experiencing homelessness, right, like access to services is what matters. Um, and um, that's also not a great story. Our emergency services system is sparse and it's shrinking. Um, David, if you could click three times, thank you, sir, just to highlight the parts so people don't have to read the whole thing. Here's a tweet from Hazard, Kentucky, um, which is the biggest place for like 40 miles, I'm sorry, 40 minutes, uh, well, probably both, um, uh, around in that area, Hazard is the biggest place. And um, in 2019, before the pandemic, the only shelter in Hazard closed, and it had only been open since 2017, so it was open for two years and then closed. Um, when it comes to veteran-specific resources, it's a similar story. Uh, the nearest GPD beds are more than two hours away. We have access to hud Vash through some PHAs, but there's not many beds for the whole area. Um, and we are covered by SSBF, um, but I think marketing, uh, at least before the pandemic, was a bit of a challenge for folks to get the word out. So simply put, we just don't have the infrastructure for a robust homelessness response system. Um, and of course, as Tony said, again, here we go, homelessness looks different in rural areas. Um, we've got uh, more doubling up, more sort of living in cars, more substandard housing, uh, precarious living situations, at least as a relative share. 
to, to urban places. Um, so we focus more on upstream responses to homelessness and, and prevention, like affordable housing development, temporary financial assistance, like through SSVF, home repair, substance abuse treatment, uh, employment services, the sort of broad spectrum of community development work. Next slide, please, David. And I promise that y'all don't have to read this, and I'm not going to read it to you. I just put it up to illustrate the sort of wide variety of programs that we have to work with uh, on the advocacy front, but also on the ground, right? Weaving together and stitching together sort of meager and disparate funding sources um, that, uh, generally speaking, are never quite geared, um, regulatorily speaking, uh, or regulatory speaking. No, it was the first one, regulatory at least. <laughs> I've lost it. Anyway, the, the programs are never particularly geared towards working well in rural areas, uh, especially persistent poverty areas, um, which which have a whole variety of capacity problems from nonprofits to private philanthropic money availability and local government buy-in and local government uh, funding and municipal services, right? It, it's, it's all different. Um, <clears throat> so the point here is that th these programs, um, we have to do a lot of work uh, and we have to look at a lot of programs to sort of make things fit the right way in our rural places. And I know the providers out there from urban places are, sc are screaming at the, the, we do that too. Of course you do. Everybody does. Um, but the important thing that I'm trying to, the important point I'm trying to make is that the regulation uh, for these programs, for instance, the Home Investment Partnership or Community Development Block Grant um, or the ESG Fund, uh, Emergency Solutions Grant through HUD, um, not quite written the right way to work in rural places. There's things that it's harder for us to do. Um, next slide, please. There's good news though, and there's a few bright spots, um, even in the relatively smaller share of the population that we're talking about here with the veteran space. Uh, I mentioned home repair is one of the upstream things that we're doing. Um, and, uh, and, you know, in an effort to keep people stably housed and prevent homelessness, um, New programs have been created in recent years, and big shout out to NCHV, who is always at the forefront of these things. Um, so y'all are in the right place. It's a, it's an excellent organization to be a part of. Um, these these new programs make it easier to do that work, make it more affordable for veterans, make it so that we can do more of this prevention work. Um, and while this program on your screen right now that I'm talking about, the VHRMP, which is impossible to remember, um, is a small pilot program. This kind of programmatic step forward is really important. Um, and, and you heard from Tony, right, about the HUD-VASH stuff, um, how uh, regular HUD-VASH wasn't reaching tribal areas and they had to create this new, in, new this new stream of program funding to make sure that, um, you know, his his veterans were getting served the same way that, that every other veteran would be. So we should all be doing that kind of work and we should all keep that up. But what I want to spend the rest of my time on, which is rapidly decreasing, um, is talking about addressing addressing our advocacy to structural issues that are making it harder to serve rural veterans uh, and rural people more broadly. Thank you, David. So I'll set the stage a little bit by talking about um, kind of the best news we've received uh, in a number of years, and that is that the Biden administration put out an executive order on equity and underserved communities. Um, and while this executive order is rightfully focused, on addressing the problems with discrimination and uh, the disadvantage that the federal government has sort of levied on people of color and other uh, other minority populations. It also, next slide please, uh, very crucially includes people who live in rural areas as a disadvantaged population. And this is in recognition of how ill-fitting uh, most federal investments are to rural places. Um, and really the share of spending that goes to rural versus urban. Before I go any further, I need to say um, that what I'm not saying is urban places are getting too much money. Far from it. The fact of the matter is, is that no one, no community in this country um, is receiving um, the amount of, of federal investment that it needs in housing and anti-poverty work and homelessness. Um, because remember, I work in cities too. So right, Appalachia is, is not just rural. Um, what I am saying is that of the meager amount of spending that does get made by the federal government, um, it's harder to access it in rural areas than it is in urban areas for a variety of reasons, some of which I haven't even touched on yet. So here's a map here to illustrate the point. 
in the recent American Re uh, American Rescue Plan legislation that created uh, something called the Homeowners Assistance Fund, which is designed to prevent uh, foreclosures of, for homeowners. Um, Congress designed it very intelligently to address uh, an issue with income limits that I'm about to talk about in a moment. Um, but then it got to Treasury and Treasury created some regulations that basically meant that anybody living in, in the highlighted counties on this map um, basically meant that tens of, tens of thousands of families that should have been eligible for the program under the congressional intent are no longer eligible simply because of where they live. You can see a bright spot where I work in Appalachia, but more importantly to the point of the executive order, you can also see huge bright spots across the U.S. South, in the Black Belt, and in the Mississippi Delta, along the southern border in the Colonias, and, and in some instances in, on tribal land. And so there's a, there's a racial component to this too. Even though it's technically an, uh, a community and ge geographical issue, uh, the impacts are, are racial justice based, right? Mississippi Delta, the rural poverty there is primarily African American. Colonias, it's primarily Latino. Um, and so there's, there's double impacts of, of both race and ethnicity and geography. Um, and it just illustrates how even in a time of national emergency, when we're, when we're sort of proceeding from a point of, of um, not worrying about the costs of, of programs and, and not having an austerity mindset quite so much, we're still disadvantaging certain populations um, because of the way that we design our programs. So next slide, please. I'm going to try to go fast here, but this is this is sort of the meat of it. This is a, a signature issue we're working on here at FAHI, and it's about rural income limits. And I said I'd come back to HUD, HUD definitions, and here we are. So despite Congress's best intentions when they created the system that distributes housing dollars and community uh, development dollars, there's a deep uh, inherent unfairness in that system based on geography. Um, and it all stems from the way that area median incomes are calculated and that, and from those, how income limits are calculated. So you've got low income, very low income, extremely low income at 80, 50, and 30% of the populations. Um, the AMIs in some of our communities are so low that our VLI and ELI populations have the same income limit. And that income limit is the poverty level. Furthermore, the difference between an average family, somebody that makes 100% of AMI, and a low-income family, uh, somebody who makes 80% of AMI, the difference is only $4,000 a year. And um, it's not that we have so 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 few um, low-income families; it's that we actually have so many that it's overwhelming the calculations. And so it's a measurement issue, not a population issue. Um, and in short. Uh, states with high concentrations of rural poverty are overwhelming the safety check system that Congress intended um, when they created this, this system. And um, the problem impacts nearly a thousand counties across the country um, with some concentrations. Um, oh, actually the same concentrations as the map I just showed you, right? Mississippi Delta, Appalachia, the Colonias. Um, and it, it harms our abilities to serve families and to get investments into low income communities and, and particularly persistent poverty communities um, in the aggregate. And this issue pops up everywhere in the federal government because so many people use that HUD metric, right? LIHTC, uh, the Home Investment Partnerships, uh, the McKinney-Vento definition of at risk of homelessness. Um, in some instances, CDBG comes in. There's a whole broad variety of, of things that are impacted and it's throughout our anti-poverty system. So uh, if you'll go to the next slide, please. We've proposed a policy solution um, that would solve the issue. Um, and uh, I've sort of just said, hey, if you want to read more about this, um, we just had an op-ed put out with um, Luke Schaefer from um, the $2 a day guy, you know, is the shorthand, Dr. Luke Schaefer, um, had a, uh, an op-ed put out in Spotlight on Poverty on the issue, which is a little bit more in depth. Um, and you can find that by Googling or binging, whatever your, your choice is, doubly disadvantaged Spotlight. Um, or you can wait because we're having a, a piece come out in the Bipartisan Policy uh, Center's website in a, in a week or two uh, on the same issue. So next slide, please. <clears throat> um, sorry, Chris, I know I'm a little bit older, a little bit over, but I'm almost done, I promise. I just want to leave folks with a few thoughts 
about structural advocacy more broadly. On the right there, you've got a map or, or uh, an image, and the graph illustrates the nearly unbroken decline in federal spending um, through block grants um, over the last 20 years. And this is the situation we all deal with, rural, urban, ex-urban, suburban, whatever. Um, our government is asking us as nonprofits and as providers to do more with less. And we can't, and we desperately need to change the way that we fund things in this country. So um, what are some ideas for fixing that? Um, investing at the scale of the problem, right? For the communities that have ended veteran homelessness, putting on my old hat here, what made the difference? Local focus from politi uh, politicians, businesses, nonprofits, community, everybody, and funding. We know that we can solve these issues if we just spend the money. Um, and we have to do that in a place-based way because rural is not the same as urban. I'm going to collapse a couple of these here. We need to build the capacity of nonprofits um, as the needs have become greater in our communities, but local government has, has sort of shrunk their, their buy-in to this work, right? Have cut services, have outsourced. Um, we need to design programs and investments that work both in cities and rural places. That's the equitable resource distribution that I've been talking about. And finally, we need to invest at scale. Again, I'm reiterating, we need to invest at scale. We have to reverse the trend of disinvestment and austerity thinking and approach our policy making through a lens of prosperity, right? We live in a very wealthy country. <clears throat> there should be no reason people have to live on the street or worry about going to see a doctor or losing a job and then losing their home. The fact that these things exist are the policy choices that we make as a country and our elected officials make every single day to continue to allow these things to exist. And it doesn't have to be that way. Um, y'all are experts, y'all know what to do to solve these problems, you just need the tools. And it's the same in Appalachia. So next slide please, David, and this is the last one with my apologies to Chris. Um, please, if you're at all interested, look up that Spotlight on Poverty piece. Um, you've got my email here in front of you, I'd be happy to talk to anybody. Um, and I'm looking forward to the questions, and, and once again, Chris, I'm, I'm sorry for running slightly long, but if you're ready, I think folks are ready for you. I am ready. Thanks, Josh, very, very much, and uh, quit apologizing. I'm uh, I'm happy you took made me have to go less time so I don't have to tap dance quite as much. Uh, first of all, thanks uh, to Tony and Joshua. Listening to Tony, you know how we talk about these conferences bring people together and we get opportunities to meet new people. Uh, just serving on this panel is going to help me a lot. We're very proud to serve in California, Nevada, and Arizona, and I'm gonna talk about us a little bit here in a second, but uh, we serve the Navajo, the Hopi, San Carlos Apache, White Mountain Apache, but we wanna do so much more. So the fact that Tony and I are connected on this uh, panel, now, unfortunately, you heard him. He said, he said, call us if we need us. So I'll be reaching out to Tony because we'd like to do more. Uh, I'm gonna turn my camera off because I'm a lot less important and I don't want you guys to see me cheat and look at my notes. What, what I plan on doing today is talking a little bit about who we are at Nation's Finest. A lot of you know us, but we undertook a brand identity change last August, and I'll explain why. But most of you will know us as we started out as Flower the Dragon back in 1972, a group of Vietnam veterans that just had enough with the care and treatment and, and abuse of the Vietnam veterans. And so they uh, said, we're going to do something about it and created Flower the Dragon. Flower the Dragon was responsible for a whole lot of everything from legislation to the startup of organizations uh, such as this one that make sure that veterans aren't forgotten. They evolved from Flower of the Dragon to Vietnam Veterans of California. Then they went from Vietnam Veterans of California to Veterans Resource Centers of America. We're in California, Nevada, and Arizona, as I mentioned. We've got 15 rural centers from which we do about 31 different operations. Veteran homelessness is kind of the center of our universe, but we also work heavily in the mental health and the other things that surround uh, the challenges that veterans have. Even if we don't do it, we take the responsibility of making sure that we 
spread the word to others. Next slide, please. Here's a little picture of what happened last year. We, I won't go over every single detail. The two things we're pretty proud of is we were able to support over 7,000 veterans last year. And 78% of the veterans uh, successfully transitioned into permanent housing from SSVF programs, which we feel is, is pretty cool. Uh, like I said, you're gonna see a lot of numbers and those numbers as I go through my, my uh, presentation are there for you to glean, but I promise you, I'm not gonna read each and every one as we go through them all. Uh, next slide, please. Why did we change from Veterans Resource Centers of America? I very humbly got to, uh, came to this organization about a year and a half ago and took the place of a gentleman named Peter Cameron who had been here for 47 and a half years. And those of you that had been involved in nonprofits, that's a long time, but his his passion was throughout and is still there in support of his original mission, which is making sure no veteran uh, suffers the challenges that he did and others of the group that founded Flower of the Dragon did. But when I was being approached about this job, I typed Veterans Resource Centers of America into the uh, my computer to see what they were. And next slide, please. Here's the challenge I ran into. Uh, and, and even though Veterans Resource Centers of America was a trademarked name, every college you go to, most libraries you go to, a lot of city halls, et cetera, have a Veterans Resource Center that is doing amazing work and doing its best to make sure the veterans find their way where they need to go. So we just kind of said, you know, we need some way to differentiate ourselves. We have a whole lot of folks, family members, spouses, et cetera, that are trying to connect their veteran to us and, and they were struggling to be able to find us. So we underwent about a year of pretty exhaustive uh, efforts to try to see what would be the best name for us. And we kept coming across uh, a, 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 a title that we felt would be, you know, strongly represented, but we thought for sure it wouldn't be available. And that was Nation's Finest. As most of you know, Veterans and active duty service folk are considered the nation's finest and have been said so from a whole lot of people. Next slide, please. Uh, president Bush in 91 said, no president can easily commit our sons and daughters to war. They are the nation's finest. What made me feel that it was probably meant to be was when I did the simple task of going online to see, okay, I'm sure nationsfinest.com, nationsfinest.org aren't going to be available because somewhere there's a hot dog or a piece of furniture or something that considers itself the nation's finest. And we're not taking it because we're the nation's finest. We're taking it because we're serving the nation's finest. Both were available. And the total amount of money I had to spend to uh, acquire those was $35 for nationsfinest.org and nationsfinest.com. So we are now Nation's Finest doing the same thing we've always done, but we now have a new name. And we went outside, and I don't know if, not to throw a plug, but uh, we went outside and actually utilized the internet to find somebody to help us create our new logo. And everybody I've talked to said it's, uh, it's worked real well. I'd love to have feedback from anybody that's out there on the call so that you can, you know, let us know if you like it or don't like it. But uh, that's why we changed our name. I'm going to talk a little bit about COVID. Next slide, please. Uh, we actually did a, a, a lot of things different during COVID. And I'll go quickly through the things we did differently because one of the things we did is the primary reason I'm here. Uh, we, we did experiments to make sure that during COVID, our veterans that we currently were serving, serving would not lose touch with us. And we also, as an organization, decided we're going to take this as an opportunity to do an aggressive outreach. We're already a rural serving organization and always have been. Our biggest cities we serve are Sacramento, California and Reno, Nevada. The rest are all uh, communities very small in population and very remote in, in geography. But what we decided we wanted to do was ensure that the additional resources we were receiving to go out and make sure everybody 
had got a touch of support, if not full support from us, would happen. So we did several things. Next slide, please. We obviously, our residential programs, no visitors, testing prior to enrollment, special quarantine areas, required PPE, and then we kicked into telehealth fairly early on so that we could do our clinical sessions via telehealth. And that way we could protect uh, not only our staff, but also the vulnerable populations we were serving. We also had to make some investments in technology. We started using Microsoft Teams for case management. We got involved and used SharePoint for document storage and program operations. We brought in new technology so that those veterans that didn't have access to computers or their phones weren't capable, they weren't smartphones, we did our best to try to make sure that they had access to that type of technology so that they could stay in touch with us. We allowed specific positions to transition to remote work permanently. And we've discovered with COVID that we saw no drop off and productivity, even though most of the folks were working from home and or a place where they could be safe. And we moved our residential programs to cloud-based client management software. Our SSVF and HVRP programs, again, no visitors. We did outdoor enrollment meetings so we could do social distancing, online cloud-based enrollments, et cetera. And we eliminated physical signatures for enrollment forms and went with the DocuSigns and the other technology to be able to do it. We added a corporate receptionist to ensure that anybody who reached out to Nation's Finest was gonna get a human being. They were not gonna have to navigate their way through the myriad of, uh, of opportunities that are there with remote answering. And, and that proved to be a huge positive for folks calling in. We added 34 temporary case managers and outreach staff. We brought in a landlord tenant coordinator and we added one healthcare navigator for each VA medical center catchment area that we serve. Next slide, please. What did we recognize? SSVF enrollments increased by 40% during the period that we measured. The TFA expenses increased by 140% over that same time period. Emergency housing placements increased by 200% over that period. And clients remained enrolled 35% longer than average. I'm sure most of you on this call experienced similar numbers. Uh, the COVID program impacts for residential programs, as you can imagine, occupancy dropped. Uh, we, we ran into trouble finding places for emergency housing access. And then when you started to put social distancing protocols, it made it tough, but it dropped by 35%. And the per diem rates increased by 54%, and that helped assist us in trying to handle additional expenses. Residential team, 95% of our residential staff members were vaccinated. 100% of residential clients were vaccinated, 75% of SSVF and HVRP clients were vaccinated, and 100% of the residential locations participated in multiple vaccine clinics with the Department of Veterans Affairs and other community-based providers. Staff impacts, we experienced an 80% increase in sick time during that measured period, and that was to allow for required quarantines during exposure periods. High-risk positions remained vacant for 30% longer when we were trying to fill them. 115% increase in overtime, 35% growth in the number of staff used during that time period. And with all of that, we only had one case of positive exposure of a staff member providing services to clients. Next slide, please. One of the ideas that we had early on was how are we gonna do outreach? How are we gonna get out to those areas? As we've talked about, whether it's Appalachia, whether it's tribal locations, et cetera, some of these areas are two, three, four hours away from any kind of support. And we had this grand idea, well, during this time period, why don't we you know, rent a few mobile homes and outfit them so that we could go and uh, bring our 
services out to uh, the area served. Uh, turned out we found out that others had talked about doing this. The VA was doing the Atlas program at a very similar time. Theirs wasn't as mobile as ours, but it was the same concept of bringing the services to the areas being served. So the picture you're looking at now was our grand idea. Uh, how do we make this mobile office have the confidentiality that's necessary? And as you can imagine, uh, our grand idea didn't quite reach the exact grandness we hoped for, but next slide. We were able to put together teams and get out and our pilot was actually uh, very successful. And I'll get into that in just a second. But we did a pilot. We chose three different sizes of motorhomes so that we could test to see which side was going to be most, most appropriate. We chose locations that were going to challenge us as well as uh, provide the potential density of population and lack of density of population. And we did a whole lot of pre-launch work. We reached out to our VA partners. We reached out to our uh, veteran service officers in all the counties we serve. We actually reached out to you know, organizations such as grocery stores, et cetera. We launched a PSA campaign uh, on, in both print and broadcast mediums, as well as social media, to let folks know when we were going to be in a certain area, how, uh, that, and by when, we meant time of day, day a week, and we were going to be consistent at that location. We, uh, we actually uh, coached our staff to you know, not be too surprised if it's not very well attended in the beginning because there needs to be a trust established. But we were incredibly surprised at the first location where the uh, motorhome, the van showed up, we had 10 veterans waiting for us. Uh, and I'm gonna go over some of the numbers because one of the things we did do uh, is surveys of all of those veterans that we, we saw when we were out in the remote locations. Next slide, please. We chose some of our most remote counties in the areas we served. Monterey County reached out to Central California and all of the cities far east, but it became a good central location to start from. Uh, Shasta County is up north and Washoe County, Nevada is another area that had a lot of access to rural folks. So those are the three areas we chose to test our, our idea. As you can see, we branded the vehicles so that when they're in a parking lot, somebody might see them and come up and ask a question. I see veterans, what's it for? And that supported it. And something I'd like to share that proved to be very successful that I had not known was even aware or wasn't aware that was available. Uh, when you go into a grocery store, you go into a local drug store, a lot of the times you'll hear something over the loudspeaker and you might listen to it, but I don't know if you're aware, but they'll play PSAs for you. So we had PSAs in all of the cities we were reaching out to, their local uh, Safeway stores, their local supermarkets, and their local CVSs, every hour were playing a uh, PSA that was letting the veterans know we were going to be in that community. Next slide, please. What did we discover? And I'm not gonna go one by one through all of these. First of all, uh, we did have people that weren't veterans come up, but 91% of the people that came up and approached us were veterans. 59% of those were US Army, 24 for Navy, 10% were Air Force, four US Marine, two US Coast Guard, and 1% were National Guard service members. Of this, I'm letting all these statistics be up there because some of them might be of interest for it to you, but I'm not going to go over all of them. 87% of the respondents reported one or more services were needed to help them. 87 again of the above respondents reported that dental services are something that were critically needed. In fact, we had one gentleman that needed dental services, and when they were provided, uh, we found out that uh, we, uh, he had a lot more complications than just the dental, but the pain from the dental is what was kind of hiding it. 66% of the respondents reported that they'd like job access, uh, 
and job related training or at least just outreach availability. 56% of the respondents reported they did not know about the benefits they might be entitled to. 68% of the respondents reported that they didn't know about the benefits their families might be entitled to. And one of the things that caught us by a little bit of surprise, but not too much, 68% of respondents reported not having reliable access to the internet. We live in a, a time where everybody has smartphones. We forget that a lot of our veterans, especially those that are at risk of homelessness or homeless, uh, don't have the latest and greatest in technology at their fingertips. So that's why it reinforced the need for our mobile access because one of the things that these vans were equipped with was telehealth and access so that they could do outreach if needed. 32%, uh, next slide please. 32% of the respondents reported food insecurity and needing access to food resources. So the fact that we had partnered with several food locations, we actually were able to uh, implement some of the food service with our uh, vans and their activity. In fact, several of them did socially distance uh, barbecues while they were serving the needs of the folks we were there. Next slide, please. We couldn't have done this alone. None of the work that any of us do can be done without the support of community partners. So these are just a few of the folks that stepped forward uh, by either doing bi-weekly setups of uh, screenings to make sure the folks coming to us are uh, folks that are in need. Uh, and it, in a lot of cases, they just were excited to have us there and overwhelmed us with uh, potential caseload. Because if you think about it, having access to a VA conduit is pretty cool, especially if you can do uh, uh, some sort of conference calling with whoever you need to talk to and do it in privacy and feel confident about it. Uh, next slide, please. I also mentioned that we had community partnerships that were very, very, very important to what we tried to accomplish. Those community partners, are, a few of them are listed here. Elko Fish with, did a monthly setup table for us. They did screenings and flyers. Home Depot helped with setup. They also did screenings, but we made a lot of new friends in these communities that we served that stepped up in a time of, of great need. Next slide, please. The end results, uh, our rural enrollments increased by 32% in Northern California and 34% in rural Nevada. And of those we enrolled during this process that enrolled in the SSVF program from July 1, 2020 to May 31st, 2021, 74% have successfully located permanent housing with our, with our support. Next slide, please. Lessons learned. Consistent rural outreach works. Veterans served by the units reported a consistent need for dental services and moderate need for mental health services in these rural areas and our ability to connect them to those services was highly welcomed. The knowledge of benefits, as I mentioned before, being able to let them know what's available to them was incredibly important to them. All of the folks we talked to reported a higher than average level of depression, they reported PTSD and substance use disorders, all of which were now evolving to be able to support better, not just there, but everywhere we serve. And as you can see in this picture, something else was learned is you should not park an MSU under a low hanging parking structure. One of our folks tried to park it in their apartment complex and ripped the roof off of the motorhome. I've been talking numbers so long, I had to throw a little bit of humor in there just to break it up. Next slide. What's the future? What's next? We've already put in and are going through the process with the VA. I mentioned the Atlas partnership that they started as a pilot program, and uh, we're going through the process to be recognized as uh, one of their providers. Uh, what you're looking at now, and you saw in the last couple slides, we actually made the investment to purchase two vans and outfit them so that they can provide a lot of the services that was in that first initial 
uh, image that I gave to you. It's got private counseling. It has uh, access to a uh, kitchen, et cetera. And we're going to actually expand what those are capable of doing. Telehealth has been the big success story, the ability for us to connect. And so we're aligning ourselves with a lot of uh, uh, psychiatric and psych, psych counseling services, et cetera, so that uh, we can schedule appointments and have those with the VA and other outside providers. We're also going to expand our fleet. We're talking to some generous uh, donors about uh, right now we've got two and our goal would be to get 15 so that we can have one for each of our service areas. But uh, the mobile service units have proven their worth. As the other two gentlemen talked about, the biggest thing we have is the challenge of getting people close to the services that are needed. And if driving three hours or four hours is an impossible task, why not bring the services to them via telehealth and or we're even working with some dental organizations to maybe bring dental care on the road with us. And that's it. And I think I finished right on time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Awesome, all right. Yes, perfect timing. We still have um, a couple minutes for Q&A, so I'll have all the speakers join me back on camera. Um, we had a couple of comments that came in and then uh, we'll, we'll use those prompt discussions. Um, first of all, thank you guys. That was great information. I think you guys did a great, uh, job of painting a picture of some of the difficulties that um, rural and tribal communities both face. I wanted to use the question time to talk about solutions. So you guys, um, you guys all mentioned the difficulty with veterans in rural and tribal communities accessing VA care. Um, and we know most of the housing programs are rooted in having that connection to the VA medical centers and having the constant contact and stuff. So Chris, you guys, you were pretty inventive with the bringing the mobile office and going out to meet veterans where they are, um, or you know, people experiencing housing insecurity where they are. Um, so I'm wondering what other ideas you guys have for transportation and how we could address this issue, because I don't know if that's practical in all communities, um, but also building like trains and roadways might not be either. So what, what are some transportation solutions? Well, I, um, I know. We, we also, in the communities we serve, have uh, vehicles that will transport on a regular basis from the locations where our offices are to the VA, because, I mean, we're in Reading, we're in Eureka, we're in areas where there isn't a VA center already, so we already provide that type of transportation service as a regular support. Uh, our reason for choosing the vans was because, you know, we couldn't drive three hours one way and then drive back five hours the other way to get them to a VA connection. So it seems simpler to just bring the bring the VA to them or bring services to them, not just the VA services. Did you have something, Tony? I don't want to jump yes. on you. Sorry, I was just going to bring up kind of leveraging other existing resources. So, you know, so for tribal communities, a lot of them have an Indian health service hospital or clinic. So just trying to co-locate or or, or shared space, Tele, uh, I think Chris mentioned telemedicine, uh, telehealth options are, are gonna become more and more the norm. And I think it's a welcome sign as people get more and more access to broadband and things like that, that'll expand that type of care and services to these communities. Yeah, I, I would agree with that too. And I would say um, two things that some of my members are doing. One is um, locating new affordable housing development near services um, so co-locating as, as Tony says um, and uh, building into um, development costs uh, especially for like senior living senior senior living situations um, building in a, a sort of a shuttle service that that can run residents to the wherever really um, the other model is if you if you are a, a high performing organization, um, or a high-capacity organization, however you'd like to say it. We have a member in Western Maryland who actually um, is the county transportation provider. They, they run the buses for the entire county as, as part of their community development mission. Um, but because they work with the low-income population and the at-risk population uh, day in and day out, they're basically able to 
you know, tailor the, the transport um, pick up and drop off locations to things that that population needs, right? So it's not just running to uh, the mall or, or wherever, it's running to places of employment, it's running to the, the hospital, it's running to all sorts of places that are that are difficult to access if you don't have a car or you don't have reliable transport in a rural place. And, and I think we all use uh, the bus services and other you know, metro transportation services if they're available to get them there. If, but as you all know, going from three hours away uh, is not an easy bus ride or an easy, you know, that three hours becomes five hours if you add the bus ride in there. Great point, Chris. It, that, that model absolutely wouldn't work for those longer distances. Yeah, that was my first thought too, is just, um, you know, subsidizing transportation ridership is not necessarily the answer. Um, just because you miss one bus and this kind of throws your whole day off. Um, we had one question. I have a participant who I guess is in Tennessee. They're wondering how they connect with Fahey and their um, area. They do outreach for SSVF um, and want to uh, connect with Fahey in Upper Cumberland, COC. Yeah, great. Um, send me an email at jstewart, so J-S-T-E-W-A-R-T at fahi.org. Uh, and I will, there you go. Thank you, Jasmine, or David, whoever's responsible. Um, and um, I'll put you in touch, either we can talk or we can have you talk to my membership team who probably knows a lot more about on the ground in Tennessee than I do. Um, and uh, I'm sure you know some of our members in Tennessee uh, who meet at the Tennessee State Caucus. And so um, we can figure that out too, and you can talk to them and they they will tell you the un, uh abashed truth of how they feel about us rather than me just giving you the company line. Awesome. And I see a couple of other questions about um, contact information and things. We do provide the slides and recordings every day after sessions. So you will get both of those um, in your daily conference email. Um, another question we have here, um, basically just what does increasing uh, affordability and housing stock look like in rural and tribal communities? I know um, it's not necessarily like your multifamily mixed use transit oriented, like, you know, super layered financing properties. So what does it look like? Is, is there, um, I guess, some way to summarize like some of the housing types that might be um, needed in these communities and what programs are available to build them? For travel communities, I say I wish it was. The, I wish that was the answer. Having all those resources coming into these communities and layering to to help uh, develop. Uh, unfortunately, that's not necessarily the case. There's just not the economies of scale that really lend investors to go to these some of these rural and travel areas. Uh, but it, it's still across the board need on different types of units, whether it's multifamily, you know, apartments, single family homes, things like that. It's, it's still a wide range of what each community needs and how it would serve each different types of families within the community and i think veterans uh and, and at risk of homelessness veterans you know they certainly fall into all those categories whether they have a, fa a family with them or not so it's still kind of across the board i, I think tribes and, and a lot of the rural uh, development organizations i mean they're, they're they're scrambling to put those pieces together right it's always just a puzzle uh trying to find the resources at the right time and put those pieces together to really lead to a good uh development project being formed and, and new units coming online so it's uh not an easy answer, but there's there's tons of uh, pieces that need to be put together and a lot of planning that goes into it. And, and, and if I can add to that, and I know Joshua talked about this earlier, uh, it we live in kind of a system where the thought is that one size fits all. And when you work in states like California, Nevada, and Arizona, your housing costs are way outside what you get the resources for to cover. We actually have a, 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 a sub uh 501 that works with us building housing and the challenge you've got there even though we build single family homes or apartments or permanent living is still finding folks that even at that affordability level can can fit so it's going to it's going to take the partnerships that both these gentlemen talked about where it, you know we can't have a reliance on one system for funding but the other challenge you've got is we're at a time where uh at least in the states we serve uh, access to affordable housing, just the availability of what affordable means in that particular remote community is is not as available as you would hope or think it was. Right. 
Okay. We had one comment um, from an uh, audience member from Alaska, just maybe something for other communities to think about. The state of Alaska, I guess, provides funding for their office um, of Veterans Affairs to create memorandums of understanding with various transportation companies, um, like taxis, shuttles, trains, airfare. Um, and, and so they were suggesting maybe looking into something like that to kind of, I guess, I guess address transportation from multiple different avenues. Um, yeah, we have a couple more comments coming in, not so many questions. So I'm gonna let you guys close out if you have any final comments or thoughts. Um, and if not, we will go ahead and close out for today. On to the next. Are you not sharing the comments with us because they're all hateful, Jasmine? Are they? Uh... <laughs> no, no, no. Of course not. No. A lot of people in agreement, just same um, kind of issues in their communities. Well, so. I'll, let's go last to first this time since Tony started this. I'm just going to say thank you for including me and allowing me to be part of this. And thanks for posting my contact information if you need our support or just looking for vetting your ideas off of somebody, I'm happy to be here for you. And thanks very, very much for uh, putting on the conference so that uh, we could share these ideas. Yeah, very similar very similar comments for me. Thanks to for the invite. Uh, good opportunity to talk to folks. And I'll just put another plug in for anybody listening. Um, Google doubly disadvantaged spotlight, have a read and then give me a call. Um, but thanks you know, to NCHV, of course, and, and to the my co-presenters here, Chris and Tony. Um, nice to be around with you and um, hoping to stay in touch. Uh, similarly, just appreciate the time today and everyone's attention and, and look forward to working with folks out there who want to start engaging tribal communities. Happy to help however we can. I will say my contact information on the screen is actually twalters at nehc.net. Uh, a throwback, I guess. There are not many .NETs left, but uh, uh, you can always go to our own website and uh, my contact information is there as well. But I uh, appreciate the time uh, today and appreciate the National Coalition inviting us to speak. Appreciate it. Awesome. Well, thank you guys and um, everybody in attendance. We'll see you at this afternoon's sessions. You guys have a good afternoon. Bye, folks. Thanks. Bye. Bye.